Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you find yourself watching this video. Welcome back to Jesus in the Center. My name is Ebony and we are going to be jumping into day 31 of our Bible in a Year reading plan. And today we will be reading Leviticus chapters 21 through 25. So let's dive into the word of God. The Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the priest, the descendants of Aaron. A priest must not make himself ceremonially unclean by touching the dead body of a relative. The only exceptions are his closest relatives, his mother or father, son or daughter, brother, or his virgin sister who depends on him because she has no husband. But a priest must not defile himself and make himself unclean for someone who is related to him only by marriage. The priest must not shave their heads or trim their beards or cut their bodies. They must be set apart as holy to their God and must never bring shame on the name of God. They must be holy, for they are the ones who present the special gifts to the Lord, gifts of food for their God. Priests may not marry a woman defiled by prostitution, and they may not marry a woman who is divorced from her husband, for the priests are set apart as holy to their God. You must treat them as holy because they offer up food to your God. You must consider them holy because I, the Lord, am holy, and I make you holy. If a priest's daughter defiles herself by becoming a prostitute, she also defiles her father's holiness, and she must be burned to death. The high priest has the highest rank of all the priests. The anointing oil has been poured on his head, and he has been ordained to wear the priestly garments. He must never leave his hair uncombed or tear his clothing. He must not defile himself by going near a dead body. He may not make himself ceremonially unclean even for his father or mother. He must not defile the sanctuary of his God by leaving it to attend to a dead person, for he has been made holy by the anointing oil of his God. I am the Lord. The high priest may marry only a virgin. He may not marry a widow, a woman who is divorced, or a woman who has defiled herself by prostitution. She must be a virgin from his own clan, so that he will not dishonor his descendants among his clan. For I am the Lord who makes him holy. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to Aaron. In all future generations, none of your descendants who has any defect will qualify to offer food to his God. No one who has a defect qualifies, whether he is blind, lame, disfigured, deformed, or has a broken foot or arm or is hunchbacked or dwarfed, or has a defective eye or skin sores or scabs or damaged testicles. No descendant of Aaron who has a defect may approach the altar to present special gifts to the Lord, since he has a defect. He may not approach the altar to offer food to his God. However, he may eat from the food offered to God, including the holy offerings and the most holy offerings. Yet because of his physical defect, he may not enter the room behind the inner curtain or approach the altar, for this would defile my holy places. I am the Lord who makes them holy. So Moses gave these instructions to Aaron and his sons and to all the Israelites. Amen. So at the end of Leviticus 21, we see the requirements that God has set out for the priest to follow when it comes to marriage, um, who they are allowed to marry, and who can't serve in the, in the tabernacle. So let's go to... Leviticus 21. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons to be very careful with the sacred gifts that the Israelites set apart for me, so they do not bring shame on my holy name. I am the Lord. Give them the following instructions. In all future generations, if any of your descendants is ceremonially unclean when he approaches the sacred offerings that the people of Israel consecrate to the Lord, he must be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. If any of Aaron's descendants has a skin disease or any kind of discharge that makes him ceremonially unclean, he may not eat from the sacred offerings until he has been pronounced clean. He also becomes unclean by touching a corpse or by having an omission of semen or by touching a small animal that is unclean or by touching someone who is ceremonially unclean for any reason. The man who is defiled in any of these ways will remain unclean until evening. He may not eat from the sacred offerings until he has bathed himself in water. When the sun goes down, he will be ceremonially clean again and may eat from the sacred offerings, for this is his food. He may not eat an animal that has died a natural death 
or has been torn apart by wild animals, for this would defile him. I am the Lord. The priests must follow my instructions carefully. Otherwise, they will be punished for their sin and will die for violating my instructions. I am the Lord who makes them holy. No one outside a priest's family may eat the sacred offerings. Even guests and hired workers in a priest's home are not allowed to eat them. However, if the priest buys a slave for himself, the slave may eat from the sacred offerings. And if his slaves have children, they also may share his food. If a priest's daughter marries someone outside the priestly family, she may no longer eat the sacred offerings. But if she becomes a widow or is divorced and has no children to support her, and she returns to live in her father's home as in her youth, she may eat her father's food again. Otherwise, no one outside a priestly family may eat the sacred offerings. Any such person who eats the sacred offerings without realizing it must pay the priest for the amount eaten, plus an additional 20%. The priests must not let the Israelites defile the sacred offerings brought to the Lord by allowing unauthorized people to eat them. This would bring guilt upon them and require them to pay compensation. I am the Lord who makes them holy. And the Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron and his sons and all the Israelites these instructions, which apply both to native Israelites and to the foreigners living among you. If you present a gift as a burnt offering to the Lord, whether it is to fulfill a vow or as a voluntary offering, you will be accepted only if your offering is a male animal with no defects. It may be a bull, a ram, or a male goat. Do not present an animal with defects because the Lord will not accept it on your behalf. If you present a peace offering to the Lord from the herd or the flock, whether it is to fulfill a vow or as a voluntary offering, you must offer a perfect animal. It may have no defect of any kind. You must not offer an animal that is blind, crippled, or injured, or that has a wart, a skin sore, or scabs. Such animals must never be offered on the altar as special gifts to the Lord. If a bull or lamb has a leg that is too long or too short, it may be offered as a voluntary offering, but it may not be offered to fulfill a vow. If an animal has damaged testicles or is castrated, you may not offer it to the Lord. You must never do this in your own land, and you must not accept such an animal from foreigners and then offer it as a sacrifice to your God. Such animals will not be accepted on your behalf, for they are mutilated or defective. And the Lord said to Moses, When a calf or a lamb or a goat is born, it must be left with its mother for seven days. From the eighth day on, it will be acceptable as a special gift to the Lord. But you must not slaughter a mother animal and her offspring on the same day, whether from the herd or the flock. When you bring a thanksgiving offering to the Lord, sacrifice it properly so you will be accepted. Eat the entire sacrificial animal on the day it is presented. Do not leave any of it until the next morning. I am the Lord. You must faithfully keep all my commands by putting them into practice, for I am the Lord. Do not bring shame on my holy name, for I will display my holiness among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who makes you holy. It was I who rescued you from the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. I am the Lord. All right, and so that is the end of Leviticus chapter 22. We see a few more regulations for the priests. Um, we see that the Lord giving them instructions on what to do and what kind of animals to present. Um, depending on if they're doing a burnt offering to fulfill a vow, if they're doing a peace offering. So God is really laying out the details for his people for how he wants them to worship him. Leviticus 23, the Lord said to Moses, give the following instructions to the people of Israel. These are the Lord's appointed festivals, which you are to proclaim as official days for holy assembly. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of complete rest, an official day for holy assembly. It is the Lord's Sabbath day, and it must be observed wherever you live. In addition to the Sabbath, these are the Lord's appointed festivals, the official days for holy assembly that are to be celebrated at their proper times each year. The Lord's Passover begins at sundown on the 14th day of the first month. On the next day, the 15th day of the month, you must begin celebrating the festival of unleavened bread. 
This festival to the Lord continues for seven days, and during that time the bread you eat must be made without yeast. On the first day of the festival, all the people must stop their ordinary work and observe an official day for holy assembly. For seven days you must present special gifts to the Lord. On the seventh day, the people must again stop all their ordinary work to observe an official day for holy assembly. Then the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you enter the land I am giving you and you harvest its first crops, bring the priests a bundle of grain from the first cutting of your grain harvest. On the day after the Sabbath, the priests will lift it up before the Lord so it may be accepted on your behalf. On that same day, you must sacrifice a one-year-old male lamb with no defects as a burnt offering to the Lord. With it, you must present a grain offering consisting of four quarts of choice flour moistened with olive oil. It will be a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. You must also offer one quart of wine as a liquid offering. Do not eat any bread or roasted grain or fresh kernels on that day until you bring this offering to your God. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. From the day after the Sabbath, the day you bring the bundles of grain to be lifted up as a special offering, count off seven full weeks. Keep counting until the day after the seventh Sabbath, 50 days later. Then present an offering of new grain to the Lord. From wherever you live, bring two loaves of bread to be lifted up before the Lord as a special offering. Make these loaves from four quarts of choice flour and bake them with yeast. They will be an offering to the Lord from the first of your crops. Along with the bread, present seven one-year-old male lambs with no defects, one young bull and two rams as burnt offerings to the Lord. These burnt offerings, together with the grain offerings and liquid offerings, will be a special gift, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Then you must offer one male goat as a sin offering and two one-year-old male lambs as a peace offering. The priest will lift up the two lambs as a special offering to the Lord, together with the loaves representing the first of your crops. These offerings, which are holy to the Lord, belong to the priest. That same day will be proclaimed an official day for holy assembly, a day on which you do no ordinary work. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. When you harvest the crops of your land, do not harvest the grain along the edges of your fields, and do not pick up what the harvesters drop. Leave it for the poor and the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. The Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. On the first day of the appointed month in early autumn, you are to observe a day of complete rest. It will be an official day for a holy assembly, a day commemorated with loud blasts of a trumpet. You must do no ordinary work on that day. Instead, you are to present special gifts to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, Be careful to celebrate the Day of Atonement on the tenth day of the same month, nine days after the Festival of Trumpets. You must observe it as an official day for holy assembly, a day to deny yourselves and present special gifts to the Lord. Do not work during that entire day because it is the day of atonement. When offerings of purification are made for you, making you right with the Lord your God. All who do not deny themselves that day will be cut off from God's people. And I will destroy anyone among you who does any work on that day. You must not do any work at all. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed from generation to generation wherever you live. This will be a Sabbath day of complete rest for you, and on that day you must deny yourselves. This day of rest will begin at sundown on the ninth day of the month and extend until sundown on the tenth day. And the Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. Begin celebrating the festival of shelters on the fifteenth day of the appointed month five days after the Day of Atonement. This festival to the Lord will last for seven days. On the first day of the festival, you must proclaim an official day for a holy assembly when you do no ordinary work. For seven days, you must present special gifts to the Lord. The eighth day is another holy day on which you present your special gifts to the Lord. This will be a solemn occasion and no ordinary work may be done that day. 
These are the Lord's appointed festivals. Celebrate them each year as official days for holy assembly by presenting special gifts to the Lord. Burnt offerings, grain offerings, sacrifices, and liquid offerings, each on its proper day. These festivals must be observed in addition to the Lord's regular Sabbath days, and the offerings are in addition to your personal gifts, the offerings you give to fulfill your vows, and the voluntary offerings you present to the Lord. Remember that this seven-day festival to the Lord, the Festival of Shelters, begins on the 15th day of the appointed month, after you have harvested all the produce of the land. The first day and the eighth day of the festival will be days of complete rest. On the first day, gather branches from magnificent trees, palm fronds, boughs from leafy trees, and willows that grow by the streams. Then celebrate with joy before the Lord your God for seven days. You must observe this festival to the Lord for seven days every year. This is a permanent law for you, and it must be observed in the appointed month from generation to generation. For seven days, you must live outside in little shelters. All native-born Israelites must live in shelters. This will remind each new generation of Israelites that I made their ancestors live in shelters when I rescued them from the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses gave the Israelites these instructions regarding the annual festivals of the Lord. All right, so that is the end of Leviticus chapter 23. We see the Lord giving the people special instructions for the festival. So we had the Passover festival, the festival of unleavened bread, the celebration of the first harvest, the festival of the harvest, um, the festival of the trumpets, of course, the day of atonement, and then the festival of shelters are all festivals that um, they are to follow from generation to generation. All right, Leviticus chapter 24. The Lord said to Moses, command the people of Israel to bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to keep the lamps burning continually. This is the lampstand that stands in the tabernacle in front of the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron must keep the lamps burning in the Lord's presence all night. This is a permanent law for you. It must be observed from generation to generation. Aaron and the priests must tend the lamps on the pure gold lampstand continually in the Lord's presence. You must bake 12 flat loaves of bread from choice flour, using four quarts of flour for each loaf. Place the bread before the Lord on the pure gold table and arrange the loaves in two stacks, with six loaves in each stack. Put some pure frankincense near each stack to serve as a representative offering, a special gift presented to the Lord. Every Sabbath day, this bread must be laid out before the Lord as a gift from the Israelites. It is an ongoing expression of the eternal covenant. The loaves of bread will belong to Aaron and his descendants, who must eat them in a sacred place, for they are most holy. It is the permanent right of the priest to claim this portion of the special gifts presented to the Lord. One day, a man who had an Israelite mother and an Egyptian father came out of his tent and got into a fight with one of the Israelite men. During the fight, this son of an Israelite woman blasphemed the name of the Lord with a curse. So the man was brought to Moses for judgment. His mother was Shilamith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. They kept the man in custody until the Lord's will in the matter should become clear to them. Then the Lord said to Moses, take the blasphemer outside the camp and tell all those who heard the curse to lay their hands on his head. Then let the entire community stone him to death. Say to the people of Israel, those who curse their God will be punished for their sin. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be stoned to death by the whole community of Israel. Any native born Israelite or foreigner among you who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be put to death. Anyone who takes another person's life must be put to death. Anyone who kills another person's animal must pay for it in full, a live animal for the animal that was killed. Anyone who injures another person must be dealt with according to the injury inflicted, a fracture for a fracture, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Whatever anyone does to injure another person must be paid back in kind. Whoever kills an animal must pay for it in full, but whoever kills another person must be put to death. This same standard applies both to the native-born Israelite and to the foreigners living among you. I am the Lord your God. After Moses gave all these instructions to the Israelites, they took the blasphemer outside the camp and stoned him to death. 
the Israelites did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. And that is the end of Leviticus chapter 24. So we see the first incident of someone um, blaspheming the Lord's name and the punishment that resulted from this. And that the Israelites actually obeyed the command of the Lord and stoned him for taking the Lord's name in, in vain. All right, so let's see what happens in Leviticus chapter 25. While Moses was on Mount Sinai, the Lord said to him, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you have entered the land I am giving you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath rest before the Lord every seventh year. For six years you may plant your fields and prune your vineyards and harvest your crops. But during the seventh year, the land must have a Sabbath year of complete rest. It is the Lord's Sabbath. Do not plant your fields or prune your vineyards during that year. And don't store away the crops that grow on their own or gather the grapes from your unpruned vines. The land must have a year of complete rest, but you may eat whatever the land produces on its own during its Sabbath. This applies to you, your male and female servants, your hired workers, and the temporary residents who live with you. Your livestock and the wild animals in your land will also be allowed to eat what the land produces. In addition, you must count off seven Sabbath years, seven sets of seven years, adding up to 49 years in all. Then on the Day of Atonement in the 50th year, blow the ram's horn loud and long throughout the land. Set this year apart as holy, a time to proclaim freedom throughout the land for all who live there. It will be a jubilee year for you, when each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors and return to your own clan. This 50th year will be a jubilee for you. During that year, you must not plant your fields or store away any of the crops that grow on their own. And don't gather the grapes from your unpruned vines. It will be a jubilee year for you, and you must keep it holy. But you may eat whatever the land produces on its own. In the year of jubilee, each of you may return to the land that belonged to your ancestors. When you make an agreement with your neighbor to buy or sell property, you must not take advantage of each other. When you buy land from your neighbor, the price you pay must be based on the number of years since the last jubilee. The seller must set the price by taking into account the number of years remaining until the next year of jubilee. The more years until the next jubilee, the higher the price. The fewer years, the lower the price. After all, the person selling the land is actually selling you a certain number of harvests. Show your fear of God by not taking advantage of each other. I am the Lord your God. If you want to live securely in the land, follow my decrees and obey my regulations. Then the land will yield you large crops and you will eat your fill and live securely in it. But you might ask, what will we eat during the seventh year since we are not allowed to plant or harvest crops that year? Be assured that I will send my blessing for you in the sixth year so the land will produce a crop large enough for three years. When you plant your fields in the eighth year, you will still be eating from the large crop of the sixth year. In fact, you will still be eating from the large crop when the new crop is harvested in the ninth year. This land must never be sold on a permanent basis, for the land belongs to me. You are only foreigners and tenant farmers working for me. With every purchase of land, you must grant the seller the right to buy it back. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell some family land, then a close relative should buy it back for him. If there is no close relative to buy the land, but the person who sold it gets enough money to buy it back, he then has the right to redeem it from the one who bought it. The price of the land will be discounted according to the number of years until the next year of Jubilee. In this way, the original owner can then return to the land. But if the original owner cannot afford to buy back the land, it will remain with the new owner until the next year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee year, the land must be returned to the original owners so they can return to their family land. Anyone who sells a house inside a walled town has the right to buy it back for a full year after its sale. During that year, the seller retains the right to buy it back. But if it is not bought back within a year, the sale of the house within the walled town cannot be reversed. It will become the permanent property of the buyer. It will not be returned to the original owner in the year of Jubilee. But a house in a village, a settlement without fortified walls, will be treated like property in the countryside. Such a house may be bought back at any time, and it must be returned to the original owner in the year of Jubilee. 
The Levites always have the right to buy back a house they have sold within the towns allotted to them and any property that is sold by the Levites. All houses within the Levitical towns must be returned in the year of Jubilee. After all, the houses in the towns reserved for the Levites are the only property they own in all Israel. The open pasture land around the Levitical towns may never be sold. It is their permanent possession. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and cannot support himself, support him as you would a foreigner or a temporary resident and allow him to live with you. Do not charge interest or make a profit at his expense. Instead, show your fear of God by letting him live with you as your relative. Remember, do not charge interest on money you lend him or make a profit on food you sell him. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan and to be your God. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell himself to you, do not treat him as a slave. Treat him instead as a hired worker or as a temporary resident who lives with you, and he will serve you only until the year of Jubilee. At that time, he and his children would no longer be obligated to you, and they will return to their clans and go back to the land originally allotted to their ancestors. The people of Israel are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt, so they must never be sold as slaves. Show your fear of God by not treating them harshly. However, you may purchase male and female slaves from among the nations around you. You may also purchase the children of temporary residents who live among you, including those who have been born in your land. You may treat them as your property, passing them on to your children as a permanent inheritance. You may treat them as slaves, but you must never treat your fellow Israelites this way. Suppose a foreigner or a temporary resident becomes rich while living among you. If any of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and are forced to sell themselves to such a foreigner or to a member of his family, they still retain the right to be bought back, even after they have been purchased. They may be bought back by a brother, an uncle, or a cousin. In fact, anyone from the extended family may buy them back. They may also redeem themselves if they have prospered. They will negotiate the price of their freedom with the person who bought them. The price will be based on the number of years from the time they were sold until the next year of Jubilee, whatever it would cost to hire a worker for that period of time. If many years still remain until the Jubilee, they will repay the proper proportion of what they received when they sold themselves. If only a few years remain until the year of Jubilee, they will repay a small amount for their redemption. The foreigner must treat them as workers hired on a yearly basis. You must not allow foreigners to treat any of your fellow Israelites harshly. If any Israelites have not been brought back by the time the year of Jubilee arrives, they and their children must be set free at that time. For the people of Israel belong to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Amen. So that is the end of Leviticus chapter 25. We see the regulations for the year of Jubilee, the redemption of property, um, the Sabbath year, and their redemption of the poor or enslaved in this section of Leviticus. All right, so that wraps up day 31 of our Bible in a Year reading plan. I, I hope you found this section of Leviticus interesting. Don't forget to download the reflection questions in the description section of the video. You can click on the link and download a PDF form for each day has a set of four questions that you can work through. Um, also, if you have not subscribe to the channel yet don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe button so that you can be notified when our videos drop but all right i will see you guys in the next video as we get ready to go into day 32 of our bible in a year reading plan all right have a blessed day bye